Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. This is week 64. This week I only have three topics, but two of them are pretty lengthy and I want to go in quite a bit of detail because I think the topic is really interesting. The first one is DJI that responds to yet another security concern report uh, from the same company I talked about a couple of weeks ago. So I want to go over this because I think this one is a little bit different. I want to talk about a report about drone sightings, which I thought was really uh, really interesting. And then the last one I want to talk about a company that has a, a, a drone with an integrated parachute. So let's get to it. The first thing this week is DJI being in the news again, but this time for a slightly different reason. Well, not really, but uh, I think the topic is a little bit different this time because uh, the company two weeks ago, I talked about them, this company, French company uh, called uh, Synactive they analyzed the flaws in a DJI Go 4 app. And a lot of you had made a lot of really good discussions on this, uh, really good comments on the, uh, on the video. And this week they came back, the same company came back and they had an analysis of the DJI Pilot app. Now, I read the report that they had created, well, actually not their report directly a couple weeks ago, another company had come in and kind of uh, helped them and, and kind of look at what they had done and kind of confirm what they had done. And this company, the second company, had posted everything that they had done in detail. And so I read, read that report, made a full report for you guys. Uh, this week, I did not find such a report with such detail, but what I found was the response from DJI and also the information from some information from Synactive. So what I want to do with you guys this week is I want to kind of show you the, the both sides, kind of what one company claims and then followed by what DJI is saying about what the claim is. So the first thing from the report, from the French company's report, says that the DJI Pilot app, and I, before I do this, actually, let me talk about the Pilot app. DJI has three apps to control their drones. They have the DJI Go 4, which is the most famous one because it controls the majority of their drones. They have the DJI Fly app, which controls two different drones, the Mavic Air 2 and the Mavic Mini, which is the, the lower level of the spectrum. And they have the DJI Pilot app, which controls larger drones and also the drones that are the government edition. So with that being said, this company, Synactive, claims that the DJI Pilot app, the one, the higher level one, um, still contains the Weibo SDK, or actually does contain the Weibo SDK. But DJI came back and said that's actually not true at all. Unlike the DJI Go 4 app, which had the Weibo SDK, the DJI Pilot app never had it. So I found it interesting that a company would claim this when it doesn't seem to be the case. Synactive also claims that the Pilot app bypasses the Google uh, Play Store, just like the same report that we saw with the DJI Go 4 app a couple weeks ago uh, when it comes to updates. So the updates would be coming directly from DJI. DJI says that is actually not the case. This app never did that. It actually only does it, and that's where they're saying that Synactive is actually uh, kind of uh, misrepresenting the information. They say that the Pilot app only updates from the DJI website if the Google Play Store is not available in the country where the user is located. They have to have the app somewhere. In this case, it's going to be on their website if there is no Google Play Store. DJI has an option called local data mode. The local data mode is basically, think about it as your airplane mode on your phone. The, uh, the drone does not talk to the internet anymore. There is no connection whatsoever other than the connection between the controller and the drone. Synactive says that in order to get approval to fly, uh, to bypass the geofencing or to get approval to fly in geofenced area, then you have to be connected to the internet. So they're basically saying that the local mode uh, doesn't really do anything and that, um, well, it, it, you still have to be connected. What DJI says in response is the fact that uh, this company doesn't really understand how geofencing actually works. They said that agencies can have a one-time approval to unlock their drone forever for a specific region if they decide to do this. And that requires the internet, a one-time connection to get that to the drone. But after this, that's it. It's an extended uh, approval. Unlike what you see on typical drones from DJI where you have to get approval every so many days. They also say that the government edition of their DJI app does not have any kind of geofencing. So they're correcting here, the company again, uh, it seems like there's quite a few uh, misnomers in this report. DJI also mentions that they've updated the DJI Go 4 app a couple days after it was all reported, after all this came out. They removed the Weibo SDK from their app and they also have all the updates now going through the Google Play Store. So 
that's the story. I want to give you both sides as always. I'm not really going to give you an opinion on this one because I think it's pretty clear at this stage what is going on right here. The one thing that I find interesting with all this is we still don't know who is paying for this report. This company, this French company, is not doing this out of the, the kindness of their heart or for publicity. They're doing it because somebody is paying them to do this. And I think it would be fair to know who is actually paying to do uh, this research, but that's just my opinion. The second item this week that I want to talk about is a look at some drone sighting data. And this comes from Jonathan Rupert. If you know uh, Jonathan, he's, uh, he has a website, Rupert Law. There's a lot of really good drone information in there. And he compiled information about drone sighting. That comes from the FAA. They have a report available. You can download the, the Excel spreadsheet and play with it yourself. He says it's actually quite a mess. I haven't looked at it. I actually love working with data, but uh, at the moment I'm, I'm busy with a lot of different projects, so I don't want to take that over. But uh, before we go into the, the nitty gritty of the data, I wanted to tell you what he says in the report. I wanted to read the report too. I'm not going to cover everything in the report. It's actually pretty lengthy, but it's very well written. And I think there's a lot of really good data in there. A drone sighting is what? A drone sighting is when someone sees a drone flying up in the air and reports it. I'm going to say that again. A drone sighting is exactly what it says with the two words, is when somebody sees a drone flying up in the air and reports it. Whether or not the drone is flying legally or not, that drone is reported as a drone sighting. So with that being said, there's a lot of things, and, and the, the summary is right at the top of the article, and it says, I'm going to read you the summary because the, I think it, it's really eye-opening. It's going to make you want to read the report. The reported drone sightings over time are not growing. They're actually decreasing, which is something that the FAA and other sources want you to believe is that there is more and more drone sighting. It's actually not true. The second point is that the FAA has actually reported the drone data incorrectly over time, and they actually have... Um, they, they actually show you the data to prove that they've reported the data incorrectly over time. I'll get into more details in a second. From the data, you can find that there are more drone sightings reported in populated areas than in unpopulated areas. I think that kind of makes sense. There's also more drone sightings reported in warmer months than there is in colder months, which also makes sense. More people outside, more chances of seeing a drone flying up in the air. States with larger population reports more drones also I think makes sense. And there's one last line in here, which I'm going to talk about more in a second. There are more medium and large animal impacts, we're talking about birds impacting airplane, than there are drone sightings every single month. Think about this for a second. There's more, peop there's more impact of, of animals with aircraft than there are sightings, not even, not even impacts of drones, just sighting in general. And I'm going to go back to this because I think it's a little bit of a controversial data and I want to make sure you take this the right way. But um, in the report, he raises some really good questions. The first one is, how can we differentiate a good drone sighting from a bad drone sighting? The fact that you see a drone flying up in the air doesn't mean that somebody is doing something bad, right? But the data doesn't tell you that. The data just says there was a drone there. How can we prevent false data reporting? There is no way at the moment to, re to, to filter the data that is actually real and not real. How can, we report, how can we prevent people that could benefit from having a lot of drone sightings out there? And you probably know which category of the industry I'm talking about. How can we prevent f this part of the industry from reporting false uh, drone sightings? He also says that, um, how many, uh, the, the question that he raises, it says, how many of those drone sightings actually pose a safety risk? How many of the hundreds of drone sightings that we see in the month, how many of those are actually reported as something that could have created an accident? According to an analysis from the FAA data by the AMA, the AMA, I've talked about them before, they found out that about 3% of the drone sightings resulted in a near meter collision, not a meter collision, a near meter collision. These are the ones that we want to be paying attention to. These are the ones that we want to prevent. The meter collision and the near meter collision with a manned aircraft, these are the ones that are going to be dangerous uh, for the people in the aircraft. If you go to the section that talks about the mis misleading data, he goes over the misleading information that the FAA released, the FAA administrator himself, and also the inaccurate information that we found in the news media. He showed that the administrator was reporting 200 sightings in the month, when the average over several periods, several months were actually less than 190. 
If you look at a different period of time, it's actually a little bit over 120 on average when the FAA administrator actually was reporting over 200 in a month. So a little bit of hype here. Um, the USA Today reported that the number of drone sightings had quadrupled over a period of time. It actually had not even doubled, okay? And uh, again, that was over the entire United States. Now, another point that he makes in here, there were 650 drones reported over a period of time over the entire United States. Drone sightings, not drone that were flying legally or none of this, just drone sightings. 650, which is not a whole lot if you think about it. Also in 2019, the data shows that there was a 6.76% decrease in drone sightings over the United States, over the entire year, all right? Now, by state, if we look at it, California, Florida, New York report the higher numbers. And if you total all those up, I haven't done the math, but if you total all those up, it's a large percentage of the entire drone sightings uh, in the year. Connecticut, Minnesota, and Alabama were on the uh, least amount of drone sightings in the US. In terms of the drone impact, what we see in here, I wanna go back to this because um, we had animal impact every single month that this was reported. There were a lot more animal impact with, drone, with aircraft, uh, with airplane, I should say, or with manned aircraft, I should say, than they were drone sightings. Now, I don't want you to take this as the fact that well, we should forbid birds, we should, we should have less regulation and all this. The, well, I want you to take this with the fact that uh, there is still a risk associated with drones impacting an aircraft, but we're putting a lot of focus on drones impact, impacting with aircraft when we should probably be looking at drones impacting with animals first. If you look at the difference between the two in terms of risk, the risk factor associated with it is a lot higher with animals, birds in general, impacting uh, manned aircraft than we have with drones. I'm not saying and I'm not excusing the fact that uh, that uh, we should be flying around aircraft and we shouldn't be worrying about this. We still need to be extremely careful and the industry still has a lot to do with staying away from manned aircraft. So I'm gonna invite you to go and take a look at this report. I want you to read it. I want you to go through all the data and kind of make your own opinion. I think the data is very well presented. It shows that sometimes we have to be careful with the hype. I also want you to remember this because the FAA is using this data. A lot of regulators are using this data in order to make decision, in order to create new regulation. They're using drone sightings Okay, instead of using data that shows where drones were actually a danger. And, uh, and I think this is a major miscalculation. The FAA actually acknowledged it in one of the NPRM when someone made the comment and said, hey, you shouldn't be looking at just drone sighting. You should be looking at drones that are actually creating a danger. And, uh, and the FAA said, yeah, we, we, we don't do that. So um, it's something that we need to keep pushing. When you make comments on NPRM, this is something to keep in mind. If the FAA is giving you data um, and saying, hey, based on all the drone sightings that we need to do this and this and this, we need to question this data. Uh, I question the data from the NPRM and the article that we created uh, because, because a lot of these of this information was actually unconfirmed. Uh, they used the information from the, uh, the Gatwick incident, which is still unconfirmed, right? So that being said, I'm going to off my soapbox. I want to keep going to the next thing. So number three this week, I want to talk about this company. It's an Israeli company called Percepto, and they're going to become... They're going to be providing a drone for the for FPL, the Florida Power and Light, that's going to help them get beyond visual line of sight approval to fly to do inspections of power lines after a storm. And uh, this, they're going to be actually the first power company to get approval to do this. They have an autonomous drone that is equipped with an integrated parachute, which is, uh, it's called a Sparrow. And uh, this is kind of what took me to this article. This is the first time that I see a drone equipped with a parachute, which uh, I think is a really good idea, quite frankly. I think it's a, it's a great safety feature. Uh, it meets the FAA standards, and you can see some videos right here playing in the background. And uh, I haven't been able to really find a whole lot more information about the drone in itself on their website. Uh, so hopefully we can find more in the future, but I just thought this was interesting. This is it. This is all I have for this week. I hope you have a great weekend and I will see you next week for more exciting information.